I can't help but push the fact that you remind yourself that it's, uh, in the Greek it's divine joy or perfect happiness. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our weekly service. This is a listener-supported ministry, and we ask that you pray and see what God would have you give. Now let's get to our sermon for today. We're starting uh, another two Beatitudes, but I want to do some, a reminder about something, and that is the word blessed in each one. I uh, can't help but push the fact that you remind yourself that it's, uh, in the Greek it's divine joy or perfect happiness. So each one you read, you can say, happy are the people to do this, happy are that, happy that. It's just another way you could say it. And and I just kind of want you to understand that because that to me is, you know, use the word blessed sometimes doesn't come out as strong as uh, happy are the the Christians that are meek. But this is the one here. Uh, By the way, we're on 5-5, Matthew 5-5. Okay, and we'll do 5-5 and 5-6 today. So it says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Also in Psalms 37 and 11, it has something similar. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Meekness is not a weakness. And a lot of people look at it as a weakness. You know, there was two really great people in the Bible that were extremely meek. Anybody want to try for it? who the two might be? No, okay. Well, number one, Christ. You read, and uh, I mean, it, uh, all through it, that matter of fact, I'm going to even quote a verse in a little while that talks about his meekness. But number two was Moses. Moses was extremely weak. The Bible talks about his meekness. Uh, I said weak, meekness. Weak, yeah. Meekness. And he, for 40 years, controlled over a million people. He judged them and he did everything. And you know, he's the only person on earth that actually got to see something of God in person. Remember up in the mountain, he got to see the reflection of his back. No one ever got that. And when he came down, his face was glowing because of what he saw. And uh, he truly was a very meek person. And as you read his history, you see that. So what I'm getting at here is powerful people can be the meekest people at the same time. Which is an interesting thing because uh, the, the word in the Greek, meekness here in this scripture, means a horse that has been broken. And I went, that's an interesting thought. What do you mean a horse been broken? The second part of the meaning refers to power under control. Now I want you to think about a horse. Horses, a wild horse does not want anybody on his back. Okay? You have to break the horse in. And the horse is not going to give up very easily. And that's why you see on TV and all the bronchin and all trying to break the horse in. Until eventually the horse gives up and takes it. And that's what it's referring to in the Greek here. Uh, That what it's referring to is the horse is broken in and now you have power under control. You get to ride it, you get to steer it, you get to do everything. And you know, horses never went away. Do you realize you're in a horse every day? Some of you have a hundred of them. Some of you have two hundred of them. But we rate everything by horsepower. What it takes for a horse to do something, because a horse is very powerful. So the average car is about probably around 100 to 200 horsepower today. So that, it's saying that it takes 100 or 200 horses to pull that vehicle. And that's what horsepower is. It's related to an actual horse. But it goes to show you one thing, though. A horse is a very powerful. How many here have ever ridden a horse? Uh, act, not a pony now, but a horse. They're not easy to get up onto. They're very tall animals and all. Very powerful animals. And the Lord in the Greek says that's what this meekness is. Power under control. And you'll understand that a little bit better. Those who are weak are truly humble and gentle. 
And with that power, with what power they may have, they understand the power that they have and keep it under control. They understand who they are and appreciate their position. Matthew eleven twenty nine says, Take my yoke, and this is Christ speaking, says, Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lonely in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now, the yoke was something that controlled the animals. You know, generally it was two of them together put around them. And they could control all that power. That's what he's referring to here. Let me control you. And my meekness will be gentle. You're not go- it's not going to be a hard thing for me to do to you. But again, it's what? God being as meek as he is. And he wants us to do the same. Now... Meekness is a quiet spirit, learning not to jump at things. Now, this is one thing that I've needed a lot of work on. God's been dealing with me for a while about this because I've been, my wife will come up with something like, you know, I got a suggestion, or I, let's try this or something. And my, generally, my first reaction is, man, I don't, I think it's a dumb thing. I, I mean, I feel that way. You know, it, it was, no, I don't want to do that. Then something happens. Uh, there's not an exact time, but roughly maybe 30 minutes later, an hour, I'm doing something. And my mind travels a million miles an hour. Uh, I may be talk, you know, watching TV, but my mind's someplace else. And, uh, the next thing I know, I'm ta- thinking about what she said, and I'm going, you know, that wasn't a really a bad idea. And so what God's been working in my life is don't jump the gun and say it's a bad idea or I don't want to do it. Keep my mouth shut and listen for a while and think about it. And it may be a good idea. And I hate to say that. Well, I don't hate to say it, but uh, you hate to realize it. But 80, 90 percent of the time, she's got a good idea. (laughs) But meekness is not jumping the gun at things. Meekness is sitting back, listen, and it, it may be a bad idea, but at least give it some thought. And you know, not everything we jump at is a good thing. And God has been dealing with me about that. So First Peter chapter three verse four says, "But let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit." which is in the sight of God of great price. Meekness is having patience. And I tell you what, most of us all need work on patience, I think. And uh, Barnes Notes tells us this. It is, it is neither mean, meanness or a surrender of our rights or cowardice, but it's the opposite of sudden anger. And that's what the, he gives the definition of meekness. It's having patience that God will work and vindicate us in due time. And in Romans twelve nineteen, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. And the problem is, we want to take, we want to get involved. If you notice here, meekness is mostly our relationship with other people and with God. Pulpit commentary tells us this, meekness is rather an attitude of the soul towards another when the other is in a state of active, actively towards it. It is the attitude of a disciple to the teacher when being taught. Uh, the son to a father when exercising his parental authority and a servant to the master when he's given him orders. So, with that said, meekness is also when God is speaking to us. He, we are the student, and we should be listening. And not only do we listen and hear it, but the problem is we need to take it and use it. Right away, you start applying for it. Now, you may make mistakes trying to do it all, but you keep praying, hey, God forgives, you know. Lord, I tried but I failed. Well, try again and try again. Dr. Bob Sr., who obviously is dead, uh, had a saying that when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hold on, but never, ever let go. Henry Ford, who was it, Henry Ford, or I forget who it said now, 
that uh, a mistake is only an excuse to start all over again. See, people, Edison, all of them, uh, like uh, the one movie said, you know, the guy tried to invent the light bulb, Edison and all. He said it took a thousand times, but only to make one time to make it work. We had a lot of great people with great minds because they never gave up. And we need to strive to learn the things that God would have us to learn. And one is being meekness. And by the way, I want to keep reminding you as we go through this, every blessed piece of our uh, attitude, uh, beatitudes, is in an order. And if you keep looking, you can't be meek without the other first two from, uh, from last week. Each one helps the other as we go down the list. So what does it mean here when uh, the meek will inherit the earth? The weakness may, the wicked people we have today, uh, I don't know if you've heard about this last thing, and I don't know all about it, but apparently they passed a bill that if an abortion fails and the baby is actually alive, they want, the Democrats want to go ahead and still kill the baby. But the bill now prevents them from doing that. And they're all in an uproar about this. And, uh, and I, I said, how bad do you get that when the baby's finally out and living, they still want to kill the baby? It's, it's terrible. But at least the bill prevents them from doing that. What I understand, I only heard it briefly. But the wicked have a temporary power right now. And God's uh, Christians should finally have dominion over land and over everything's going to happen. And we will get the victory at the end. Think about this. Does wickedness produce peace? Uh, uh, does meekness produce peace? If you think about it, it really does. How can there be a fight if one person refuses to do the fight? of the other person. One person may want to fight, but you can't have a fight if I'm not going to fight. Uh, this reminds me of something. There are times that I see a regular TV show or something that reminds me of things of scripture. And one of them, how many here ever watched the movie Kung Fu or the series David Carradine Kung Fu? Uh, if you know it, I, I used to do uh, Wing Chun Kung Fu back in the early years. I took lessons and all that stuff from it. But the Shaolin priests did exist, and they were something. And uh, the movie naturally dramatizes it a little bit more, but they, they were something. And, uh, but in the movie, what's interesting, he spends all his life becoming a legal weapon, and he can do so much with his body. I mean, some of the things was just uh, amazing. And yet... He was the meekest person you ever met during the whole series. You could, it was hard to get him to fight. See, and that's what God's teaching us here. We can have all this stuff that available to us, but we need to be meek and use it properly. And it takes always two people to have a fight. Barnes Notes tells us meekness produces peace. It's a proof of the truth, greatness of a soul. It comes from a heart too great to be moved by little insults. Romans 12, 20 says, Therefore, if thy enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. A person can't react to kindness. <laughs> they don't know how to. They're, they're used to it. They, if, if they're going to try and, and do you harm, they expect you to fight back. So if an argument comes up, be kind and meek. It takes two to have a fight. Be kind to your enemy. And God will do the rest. And who knows, you might actually lead that person to Christ one day. You know, like Lazarus did while he was on earth. He had nothing. And then when he died, he was in the bosom of Abraham. And he had it all comfort everything. The rich man had everything before he died. Now he died, he had nothing. So who won at the end? The meek did. 
Ryle says this, He means those who are of a patient and content spirit, they are willing to put up with little horror here below. They can bear injuries without resentment. They are not ready to take offense. Like Lazarus in the parable, they are content to wait for the good things. Blessed are all such. They are never losers in the long run. Let God do what he will with us. If we're going to be meek, God wants us to submit. Uh, live our lives calmly and without murmuring. Let God have his way with us. The end result, the meekness, is a powerful tool. It's been proven in Scripture. Willing to be instructed by God. That's got to be part of our meekness, to be able not to just sit here and listen, but to take it in and apply it when you leave. And that's the key to greatness. Being free of malice towards those who wrong us. Having command over one's passion and in doing so they will have everlasting peace we are Christians and we will inherit the earth one day now let's go to number Matthew 5 6 <laughs> blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled Ryle says this he means those who desire above all things to be entirely conformed to the mind of God. Hunger and thirst are an expression of strong desire to have something. Is it not? If you're starving, you got one thing on your mind. You want to get food and drink. And nothing else matters. And that's what God is using this illustration for us to go after the things of Him. You know, there's lots of things that I'm going to hit real quick here. <laughs> There's so many things in our life, work, cars, money, retirement, uh, insurance, I mean, you name it. All of them are okay, but when they're wrong is when God's second below them. When they're not, when God's number one, everything below it is good. When God is down at the bottom and you're too busy to do this and that because I can't go to church today. I can't read my Bible today because I got to be out doing stuff. That's not God being number one. And when he says the thirst and hunger at it, this is something that we got to strive for. Something that when you're really starving, nothing else matters. You don't care about the bike. You don't care about the house. If you're starving, you're worried about being fed, drinking. So hunger is, and thirst is a strong desire to have something. To learn as much as possible about God, looking forward to your morning devotions, to see how God's going to bless you. Wouldn't it be exciting to get up each day and be excited to see what God's going to do in your life? Be excited about it. So many people have told me over the years since I've been a Christian, how many of them did, did devotions in the morning? And how God worked things out that what I got that morning was exactly what I needed for that day because of some of the things I ran into. So when you see God working like that, to me, you get excited. What's the next thing God's going to show me? How is he going to work in my life today? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they know them because they are spiritually discerned. Just look at the world around us today. The icy foolishness. What gets me more than anything when I start watching the TV is who are complaining about the economy, the oil. Naturally, the oil controls just about everything we do. That's the whole reason. But strangely enough, when... when when I saw the, this is the second time it's going down, but the first time it went down about a month ago, I didn't see food prices drop. <laughs> the people were taking advantage of it, the money. Then it went back up again. Now it's back down. It's starting to go back down again. But it controls everything in our life. 
And what gets me is we just had an election and the very people that complained went ahead and voted the same it it was back in, in that caused the problem. I would vote for Democrats if they were the one doing the good stuff. But unfortunately, they're the ones doing the bad stuff. And they walk around like Biden with his papers. And he just found some more papers in another room. And the worst part about it, I found out that the house they're talking about isn't even his house. It's his son's house. Now, he has access. That's his son. The one that's the criminal. And you mean to tell me they're walking around and the boxes of... Oh, I mean, they need to put him in jail. And his son. But they don't. And if you, I mean, you probably, a lot of them probably don't watch the news, but they're interviewing the Democrats right now. And they're, oh, well, he, he admitted that he had it. He didn't hide it like Trump did. Trump never hid anything. He just said, you can't come in and get it. I ain't giving them to you. And then I found out when they took the pictures of all the papers on the floor, that was the FBI put them down looking at the papers. But they didn't say that in the news. They said, that's how Trump left the papers. No. I don't know if people are ever going to wake up and see. I'm not saying the Republicans are doing a fantastic job. The fact that it took them so long to uh, vote for the Speaker of the House. And, and like I told my wife, he was going to get voted in. There was no question about it. But they had to do stupid things. They can't be. And the one thing I gave the Democrats is every time, see, they were voting for a speaker too. And every time the, the madam lady or whatever said, all the Democrats voted for this guy. She specifically, and I don't blame them. Because at least they're united. Our world is foolish. And I hate to say that. MacArthur tells us this, that the Beatitudes speak as a strong desire of driving pursuit of a passionate force inside the soul. It has to do with ambition, ambition of the right sort, whose object is to honor, obey, and glorify God by partaking of his righteousness. And the word righteousness means learning everything God would have for us and, and using it and applying it to our lives. Don't just walk out of here and don't change your life. Every time you come in here, there's something you should be changing in your life when you learn. Now, you may learn something you already know. Well, that's great. You should be doing it. Example, I'm going to give you an example of people that went wrong. Lucifer. Lucifer was the most beautiful angel, the scripture says. He had everything. He was the only person higher than him was God. He was total control of this universe and everything in it. But he had to be number one. He had to let pride get into his heart. And he lost everything. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon. And he had it all, but he wanted praises. And God made him act like an animal. For I forget, I didn't look up the how many, how long he was. And he lived like an animal in the woods on all four for a while until he recognized God was the one in control. Was it seven years? Okay. And, uh, and then God put him back on the throne. The rich fool that's written about in the scripture says, one day, look, I got all these, my barns are full. So I think I'll just tear one down and build a new bigger one. And then he went, well, what the heck? I'm just going to sit back and enjoy and just live off of my stuff the rest of my life. And God took everything away from him. And my wife just brought up uh, that Presley's daughter just died. And uh, and that uh, she's been hooked on drugs and all. Now, I didn't know this, but this is what she was telling me, so uh, we don't know for sure. But roughly when Presley died, she inherited $100 million. She died broke. Think about that. And she was what? 54. Yeah. Die broke. 
well, I don't know what the statistics did today, but many years ago, and I brought this to your attention, when they interviewed 10 people that won the lottery, huge multi-million lotteries, only nine of the 10, oh, I'm sorry, only one of the 10 still had the money. Just three or five, four years later, the rest of them were broke again. And then you think of the prodigal son. I want my inheritance, he says. Give me my inheritance. And he went out. And what did he do? He blew it off. And the next thing you know, he's eaten the food of pigs. And then he finally comes to a sense and says, you know, my father's servants eat better than I do. So I'm going back and be a servant to my father. And gracious God opened the door as an illustration and took him in. He lost his inheritance, by the way. The other son still had his and all. But he was under God's grace and they took care of him the rest of his life. God, if we're not careful, God can take things away from us. The things that were closest to us. And the thing he takes is not necessarily a bad thing. It's because we got it in the wrong perspective. God isn't first above all the things that we have. And he can take that away from us. Matthew 6.33 is a very familiar verse. But, and, and if you read the chapter, it will give you more meaning. But it says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And if you read the thing ahead, that, that, this life, it's everything you ever wanted. But first, God's got to be first. And that's what he's talking about here, about being thirsty and hungry. And it's all because people, they hunger for the wrong things. And it's happened to a lot of Christians that have lost a lot of things. Do you want enduring happiness? Our Declaration of Independence asserts that the citizens have the right to pursue of happiness. And why are so many people not doing that? People seem to... You interview a lot of people and you know what they say about their job? It's a job. They're not really happy in it. And more people are unhappy in it than are happy. They tolerate things. Christ tells us the way to happiness is the way of truly being blessed by God. It is the way of spiritual hunger and thirst. Spiritual hunger and thirst. Hunger and thirst represents the necessity of physical life, does it not? Christ is telling us righteousness is required for the physical life, as well as our spiritual life. Just as food and water are required for life, so is our righteousness. MacArthur tells us this, Righteousness is not an optional spiritual supplement, but a spiritual necessity. We can no more live spiritually without righteousness than we can live physically without food or water. He goes on to say, A starving person has a single, all-consuming passion for food and water. Nothing else has the slightest attention or appeal. Nothing else even gets his attention. And that's true. We should be acting the same way a starving person does towards God and righteousness. Too many Christians turn, themse turn to themselves, unfortunately, and look to themselves and to, instead of to God. You know, a dog returns to his own vomit and eats it. A swine, after you clean it and everything, goes right back into where it made the mess. First Corinthians 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can they know him. I said this earlier, because they're spiritually discerned. Think about that. This is God talking to us. Proverbs 26, 11 actually says what I quoted you. A dog returns to his vomit, so does the fool return to his folly. Because they don't learn the lesson. They walk out of church. Some people never get saved and they go to church every Sunday. And they may actually hear a salvation message. Some of the churches probably don't even do that. I just, I don't know who the actor was, but it was on Facebook. Said that 
if you go to a church and you're being entertained and it went through a bunch of stuff what churches do today, you need a new pastor was at the end. And too many people go to church to be entertained, not to be told what to do and how to do it so they can have a good life. A lot of things we buy only give us satisfaction for a short time. Listen what Isaiah 55, uh, 2 says, Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and for your labor for that which satisfies not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness, referring to the word of God. Christ is warning us here about being blessed. It's available to us. We just got to do it his way, not our way. The prodigal son was a great example about that. 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... By the way, the three things I'm going to give you is the root of all sin, in case you're not aware of that. And think about this now. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God will abide forever. Just remember one thing. One day, assuming we're all saved, which I assume we are, and we end up in heaven. I don't know how you'll think about it, but this is what I think about. When Christmas comes up, and you know I'm a fanatic Christmas person, and then when Christmas finally over that day, I look back and go, wow, that was quick. But when I was a little kid, you know, I mentioned that it seemed like it would never get here. It took forever to get here. But then when Christmas was done, I would look back and go, boy, that was quick. And I think we're going to say the same thing when we get to heaven. You know, it's 80, 90 years, whatever. You know, my mom's 99 now and all. And one day when she gets to heaven, she's going to look back and say, boy, that was a fast 99 years. We have a way of looking at time that way. Thrive after the things of God. The Beatitudes are giving us a way to enjoy life. And it's amazing. And remember, I could spend so much time, I could do one sermon per Beatitude and still have stuff to tell you more than once. There's just so much involved here. So I'm trying to pick the the top of the surface here. Will you have a full and happy life because of all this? It's up to you. I can't make you do it. God's not going to make you do it. God doesn't want pulpits that want a string. Now, he does control things in our lives, makes them open and closes doors, but he doesn't make us do any of it. It's always our option to take door number one, door number two, or door number three. And only one of those doors is God's will. The other two are not. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Father, I thank you all the time about that because each day is another day that we can grow closer to you, that we can surrender ourselves to you. Today you spoke to us about meekness, about hunger and thirst after righteous. Father, help us to really comprehend what that means and what how we can really enjoy life and have a wonderful time while we're here. And if we seek these things first that you have, all the things that we probably would love to have, we have a way of bringing into our lives. And and just I pray that you'll help us to understand that, to realize that. Open our eyes the way you did to Elijah's servant. Help us to see the things of God what you're trying to do in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that we have been a blessing to you. For further assistance, call us at 864-270-1472 anytime. 
Send email to info at stlmm.org or visit our website at www.stlmm.org. Like any ministry, it costs money to operate. Please consider supporting this ministry as God leads you with your prayers and your financial gifts by going to www.stlmm.org and clicking on Donations.